So let's go with a Cassandra overview, right? So Apache Cassandra is a distributed NoSQL database. Everything in the world is very important. Uh, NoSQL, so it's not working the same way as you may be, as used to with a relational database, uh, like Oracle, MySQL, PostgreSQL, it's not the same. And it's distributed. So you can install Cassandra on a node, on a machine, single node, it's work technically, uh, Speaking, it's feasible. And on a single node, you can store about one terabyte of data and do about 3,000 transactions per second per core. This is our Abacus thumb, thumb rules. Uh, but as I told you, it's distributed. There is really no sense to install Cassandra only on the single node. It's distributed. You will have multiple nodes. Each node, each node communicates to each other using a protocol named gossiping. And there, there is no master. So it's not a master-slave architectures, masterless. And we can group nodes, uh, functionally speaking, in something called a data center or a ring. Uh, I will use uh, probably data center a lot of time uh, during this presentation, but yeah. be aware that it can also be called a ring. So what's the use case with such distributed stuff? Well, first, you need more capacity, you simply add new nodes. And you need more throughput, you simply add new nodes. So we hide here the green, the red, and the purple uh, names database. You know, you can always scratch, you, know, you can always um, change a benchmark to say what you want him, what you want him to say. But what's important here is you can see the progression, you know, the more nodes you add, the more throughput you have, and it scales linearly. And this is quite the only database who can scale linearly. And we do have uh, customers and uh, users of Apache Cassandra open source out there with hundreds of thousands of nodes, okay? Multiple petabytes online. And so first range of use case, it's scale linearly. So it's not putting a lot of CPU or RAM on the single node. No, here we are more community hardware, add multiple small nodes, uh, and you scale um, horizontally instead of vertically. I want to say a word here. Can you have a slide back? So uh, guys, usually we scale things horizontally, so adding new nodes, or vertically, replacing old node with a more powerful node. Those who did that vertically know how very soon it becomes extremely expensive. And uh, as more, the more data you store, the more clients you have, you have to go to extreme scale vert with vertical scaling to the very extreme prices. And with horizontal scaling, you still scale not only your uh, data and throughput linearly, but also scale your money, cloud costs linearly, which is also very great when you handle petabytes over the world. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is my data center with seven nodes. And now let's say I would like to create a table in there, single table. So full disclosure, in Cassandra, you put tables, not no JSON, no key value. It's a table. OK, in the table, you will specify one colon that will be called a partition key. Uh, it could be multiple colon, but let's say one. And even with, let's say, 10 records, this is how the record will be stored in Cassandra cluster, okay? Based on the value of the partition key, values are distributing among the node around the data center. That means select star from a table is not a good use case for Cassandra. Don't do you it you would like to provide the values in red, which is a partition key, and then start working on the single node because all the data will lay on the, single, on the node you are working on. So the red column, the partition key, will be in your workflows. Okay, move forward. So uh, data is distributed around the cluster, but even with this very simple uh, sample, you can tell that, yeah, if I choose to, 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 to say um, first letter of the country name could be the, part, the, the value of the 
could be the partition key. Yeah, that's not good enough because most of the data will be on the same node. You will have what we call the data skew and a single node do all the work. And this is the reason why uh, Cassandra has an internal mechanism uh, to distribute evenly the keys around the cluster. When you hash the, the partition key, you get a number, which is called a token, and a hashing function ensures that the token distribution is evenly distributed around your node. And a node acts not only as a single node to distribute the tokens, but multiple virtual nodes. And that way, your data is evenly distributing among the node, and each node is in charge of a token range, so a fraction of the world table. Cedric? Yes. I want to have a word about why it happens and why do we need that. That's not just a crazy idea of some evil genius. There is a very serious background behind that. So take a look. When we think of Cassandra, we have to think of three things. How it was designed, why it was designed to be this way, to be working this way. It's Cassandra is designed to be first working with any amount of information. You have 10 megabytes of data, that's fine, but usually don't use Cassandra with 10 megabytes. You have hundreds of megabytes, you have hundreds of terabytes, it's still fine. You have petabytes, Cassandra handles it. So any amounts of data, point number one. Point number two, which is even more important, Cassandra is designed to be extremely quick and moreover predictably quick when working with C.1 tremendous amounts of data. And trust me, it's not easy to be very quick when you work with petabytes. And third one, we will discover in a moment, that's about distribution. So, uh, and uh, to close it up, when you work with big data, you cannot store all your data on a single server. It will be or not possible or simply too expensive, and you definitely will not be able to make it uh, so uh, scalable as Cassandra does. Cedric? Yep, thank you for that. Okay, so how does it work? Well, I do have a value to insert into this data center. I just come. My partition key, let's say called data, is hashed, created a token. Here my token is 59, and I can contact any of the node. Remember, there is no master. I can pick any of the node. These nodes say, oh, I'm in charge of this range of token. 59 is not part of my range of token. So I will move the correct value to the correct replica node. Doing that, I'm a coordinator node, and I will send the value to the replica node. But guess what? Data is distributed, but data is also replicated. The, fact, the, the, the variable to set up the, the replication is RF, replication factor. So here, if I set replication factor two, now a, a range of token is stored in two nodes. And when I contact one node to say, I would like to store 59, now the coordinator node needs to send the data to two replicas. Best practice is to go to replication factor three, and we will see later why it has to be an odd number. So now I can send my data to the three replica. So remember, data is distributed, data is replicated, and there is no master. What does it mean? That means you can lose any of the nodes from the data center. It's not a big deal at all. You can lose a node. So what will happen if, the, if one node uh, goes down? Well, I need to insert 59 again this coordinator node will send the data into the two remaining replica and it will store the value for uh, to be able to send the, the the value when the node comes back online so when the node goes back online it will catch up stream the data that he missed this is my mechanism is called intin and off and by default is set to two hours you you don't want that to be too long or you will have too, data, uh, too much data stored locally on the coordinator nodes, and it will take quite some time to catch up uh, when the node goes back online. And that would give you a lot of pressure in the CPU and RAM when you do that. 
Okay. So, hey, uh, Cedric, rest- Cedric, yep. sorry, yes. uh, you are speaking like it's something simple and obvious, but uh, as a person who maintained and supported a lot of a database servers in production, I want really to highlight this point. Usually, whatever time of a year, whatever time of a day or night, mostly night, when you have your server on fire, you have to wake up and run and take care of the sheet while your production is on fire and your business manager is angry and clients are just uh, whining all the time. With this shiny thing, with replication factor three, with replication factor five, or maybe even with multi-data center deployments, which is very simple, I can wake up in the 9 a.m. and see, okay, I have an issue with my server, so I can take care of it. Of maybe what we had issue, and now it's fully recovered because of uh, hinted handoffs. Come on, guys, that's a piece of art. <laughs> yes, yeah, so several range of use cases. Uh... No data lost. You want your service to be always available and don't rely on a master who could fail and you know need to fail over. Okay, in a, in a Cassandra cluster, you can have one, but also multiple data centers. So you can create a data center in a EME region, another one in APAC, and yet another one uh, in America. And you can read and write from anywhere, and Cassandra will replicate the data for you. So data, let's say the replication factor is three, replication factor is three within a data center, but you can also say, I would like also my data to be available in data center number two, or data center number three, all all the three. Each time you read and write, you will pick the uh, data center which is the closest to you, you know, limit uh, latencies as much as we can, and data and Cassandra will replicate the data for you asynchronously. Uh, even if the bandwidth is not uh, great, it, it will it will do it when the network come back. So this is very useful for geographic global company. So this is the reason why, let's say that uh, Uber, um, Apple. Um, and all the web giant uses massively and contribute to Apache Cassandra uh, because those guys do have a global uh, user base. And when you take Uber in Paris to take your flight, to catch your flight, uh, when you land to the other side of the world, you want your uh, you know account to be up to date. And this is how it does. This is how Uber does it. Well, uh, nowadays, uh, sorry, man, but nowadays it's a pretty bad example because no one oh, gets... All right. <laughs> <laughs> I did not that on purpose, you know. Yeah, but I mean, it's still good. So I let's, mean, let's pick another sample. You know, Netflix. You know. Yeah, Netflix yeah. I've heard of users. Netflix, and um, I'm pretty sure startup. that Netflix, I'm pretty sure that Netflix needed to scale up at the moment to scale out. Yeah, they they okay, reached so- the new heights, and I, I've just gotten used today what Netflix got the top score of active subscribers of for, for the whole history. Well, no surprises. And Netflix, one of the biggest Cassandra users, and moreover, Cassandra contributors. Yep. And uh, one point from my side. So take a look again. For those who know what is master, master, multi-data center, active, active deployment, those who did that already usually start to cry because with traditional relational databases, it's a very painful process and very error-prone process. Cassandra is designed to be multi-data center, so that's a very native process to run it in multiple data centers all across the world. Yes, and what can be done uh, around the world can also be done technically speaking. You can install a data center in uh, on-premise or on any cloud provider, public or private. Uh, to be honest, Cassandra is on most uh, marketplace right now. Some also provide the service as a service. Uh, so simply create a data center on the cloud provider you like, make those data center part of the same cluster, and now you do have a single data layer available everywhere. Okay, that's not magic. Technical people will say, ah, what about communication uh, from cloud to cloud? Yeah, you still need to open the correct uh, IP port uh, and do some VPC peering, but you don't have to have, you don't have to need, a, you don't need a very uh, good bandwidth. You know, Cassandra will work 
how it can. It will replicate when the bandwidth is there. So very good use case, single technology to have the same data layer available all across the clouds. OK. Um, Next time, I should pick a menti question for this one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> OK, so in a distributed system, there is a famous theorem, the CAP theorem, or Mark Blue theorem, telling that you cannot achieve three things at the same time, consistency. That means all the nodes uh, have the, the same data and you know are in sync. Availability, you can lose any of the nodes. It's not a big deal. And partition tolerance, you lose the network between two nodes. Uh, and in, in a, you know, master slave architectures, as uh, Alex told, if you lose the network between the master and the slaves, then the part of the network with only the slaves will have to elect a new master. And when the network goes back, uh, yeah, you do have two masters in the cluster now, and you do have what we call the split brains problem. So uh, famous technology, uh, master slave using that, CP or, you know, Kafka. Cassandra, with everything we told you by default, is available. You can lose any of the nodes, and it's partition tolerant. You can lose a network between nodes, between data center. It's not a big deal. You do have the Intune on to help you. So what about the consistency? Well, by default, you cannot. Uh, you, it's not the priority to have the consistency. So don't worry. Be happy, OK? Uh, but by configuration, by design, you can uh, be as consistent as you want. But if you move to consistency, yeah, you might lose availability because you cannot have, you can have, you cannot have everything. Yep. I want uh, to add here something. So in the uh, fantastic world of ponies and unicorns and rainbows, it all works perfectly even on the distributed systems and you have consistency, availability and partition tolerant, uh, tolerance at the same time. Uh, if you have a ticket to get to this country, please send it to me. I really need one. So everyone who works with the cloud or even with some custom uh, data centers know what everything what can be broken will be broken. It's just a question of time. Network, power, whatever you have, it will be broken at some point. Then at the time of a failure, at the time of a bad network, you have to decide availability and partition tolerance or consistency and partition tolerance. And the point is, first people call Cassandra available and partition tolerant. I prefer to call it configurably consistent and always partition tolerant. But there is a really nice trick to be all the time at the same time and consistent and available and partition tolerant on the consistency levels, which we will discuss very soon. Here we go with some magic. Yep. OK, so tunable consistency, as you said, Alex. So here it's come. You do have a single data center. Client comes and want to store a data. Uh, so coordinator will replicate the data three times and send the data to the three replica. For each request, you will define a parameter named the consistency level. And it will say to the coordinator node, how much time do you need to wait until you can consider that the query is successful? So here, the, the first sample is CL1, consistency level 1. You only need to have the acknowledgment of one node. And then you can tell the client, request is success. Other node will, would have the, the, the mutation, the modification later on, but at the point where the client gets the acknowledgement, maybe only one is up to date. Most common pattern is quorum. You do want the majority of the node. And this is why the uh, replication factor is an uh, uh, odd number, because it's easier to get a majority. Here, you want only two acknowledgements of a three replica to say that the request is successful. If, we do, if you would have replication factor four, then first you lose some space, okay? Because now data is replicated four times. But also now you need three acknowledgements uh, to get your uh, request to be successful, so it's slower. And yeah, that's the reason why replication factor three is you know 90% of the time. Sometimes you can go up to replication factor five because you are maybe on hostile environment. You know, you can lose multiple nodes depending on which close cloud you're running. Don't think you're pointing anybody here. OK. And you can also say consistency level one. 
And if you look that, now you are fully consistent. That means when the client gets acknowledged, you are sure you're, you can ensure that all replicas are up to date. But, and now if you lose any of the nodes, the request fail. So you are not available anymore because you need all the replica to be uh, running to make this query successful. Yep. Okay. You, re you remember our CAP circle when you set consistency level all, you move Cassandra to fully consistent and uh, fully partition tolerant, but not highly available anymore. And at the moment you write a query and you have one node not available for any reason, you will get an exception like, okay, I cannot reach desired consistency level. It's just not possible. One of the nodes is not responsive. Please try again later. Yeah, so to comes to this uh, slide, which is one of the most important, is say, if you want to achieve immediate consistency, you will try to have consistency level read plus consistency level write bigger than the replication factor. So this, this is the reason why everybody is doing quorum quorum, because here replication factor read is two over three, replication factor write is two over three. So two plus, two plus two is four bigger than the replication factor. So you're good to go. That means when I write the data and let's say only the two nodes, the two replica on top are updated. And for some reason at the very same times, I read the same data and I also said quorum, and for this one, no luck, I not pick the two on the top, but the two on the bottom, like that. Yeah, now uh, the coordinator node will have one node updated and one node that is not updated. And you know what? The last write always win. And so you will get back with the latest value uh, to your client because every modification is time-stepped. And yep. this is also one of the reasons uh, all the nodes should have the same clock, right? So here the magic comes. So technically, you are eventually consistent, and some of your nodes may get data later than others. But for developers, it makes no difference because they always get uh, the most up-to-date information, always. Magic. Yep. yep. Uh, OK, let's move forward. So I will go a bit with this use case. So now you can just take uh, a screenshot of this slide. Um, this is, yeah, Cedric, sorry, we have two very good questions I would like to answer if you don't mind. Go. Uh, first question is, how are the coordinator node decided? So uh, there are no decisions or votings. Every node which receives a query will work as a coordinator node. So every node keeps the same responsibility and ready to dispatch any kind of request. That's the first step. Second step, when, uh, so a cluster is a complex thing. There are really a lot of job under the water you cannot see. The main point, <laughs> so, um, Every node is a very smart thing. Actually, every uh, driver on your application is also very smart. It knows how the data is allocated within the cluster, so schema allocation. And then you get a query for the partition. The uh, coordinator node already knows which one to ask because it knows the schema allocation over the cluster. That's the first point. And by the way, uh, your driver does the same job. So as soon as the Cassandra driver connects to a cluster, it will load data allocation uh, schema and ask the particular node responsible so for this data so we can avoid one more network request. Cassandra is very well optimized. Second question is, <laughs> how does the application choose, oh, okay, um, Sorry, David answered. Okay, how old nodes handle new nodes and token ranges move? I see some people of culture here. I see some people with production database experience because yes, that's a really great question. The answer is Cassandra cluster handles new nodes and also discarding of old nodes uh, fully automatically. So when you add a new node, data shuffles to a new node Full automatically, and the lot on our nodes will be decreased. Some data is moved in complete automated manner, and then then you d discard an old node and want to move it out. It's completely fine. Data will be handled by our nodes. Just inform cluster what you are going to drop one of the nodes. 
Yep, you could. The yep. keys tokens are redistribute when you add new nodes, simply like that. And as you said, uh, the driver at the client level is very intelligent, is very clever. He is what we call token aware. So that guy knows on which replica the data will be. And so when you insert something, uh, the coordinator in practice will be one of the replica. So it will write the data immediately uh, on local disk and then uh, ask his uh, friend to do the same. Um, and the client do load balancing uh, among the three or X replica, depending on the replication factor you put. So uh, quickly, um, so good use case for Cassandra are you do need scalability, high throughput, as volume, high volume, so every read, every write, and this is why you sh you come up with Cassandra in Internet of Things, any kind of uh, time series related, even streaming, log analytics. Guess what? That's a pretty good data set for uh, machine learning algorithms, right? Everything related to time series, and as you do have massive amount of data, you can totally train uh, in a model quite with some accuracy, and you may not have been to extract everything as a big CSV. Why? Because in Cassandra, there are already tables. About availability, of course, uh, you can lose any of the node, and uh, that's pretty good to have always on app uh, and provide data all across the world. It's distributed, you show, you show the different uh, pattern globally or uh, in multiple cloud. And this is also the reason why we said cloud native, because well, in the cloud world, you are not master of anything, bandwidth, CPU, RAM, everything is shared, multi-tenancy, right? So having the capability to lose any of the nodes is pretty convenient. And it's pretty easy with the networks to do hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. You don't have to copy the data yourself. Cassandra is doing that for you. Okay, I will go quick with the data, with the data model because you saw that in Cassandra you do have one or multiple key space which has kind of oracle schema so you can have multiple key space um, in a cluster in a data center and this is at the key space level that we will define oh my data should be on a single data center multiple data center and each time provide the replication factor then you do have tables and it, in the tables you do have partition remember Partition keys, the value of partitions. Uh, this is how it distributes the data around the cluster. But partition is not a primary key. Partition itself, it's not and does not ensure unicity. It's like of the group by for your queries in some way. So here is a sample. If I create a table, user by city. So city will be the partitions. Phoenix partition key, and here you saw multiple records within a partition. And there are big, be, the best practice to have no too big partition because hey, you know that you need to work with Phoenix, go to the node, and if they again have a million rows in the Phoenix partition, it will still be slow. So you have to pick your partition in a way that your queries are efficient and do not have the partition too big. And you can type a ton of questions, and I do have a full crew of data sacks for credit ones. So well, that's pretty nice bucketing questions. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. Right. So I told you that the partition itself is, does not ensure unicity of a record, but you still need to ensure unicity. You still need a primary key. So. In addition to the partition key, you will find clustering colon, which are uh, the colon on which you need to sort and order the results and also ensure unicity. And then you have data colon. We can totally be empty, no problem. Okay, enough talking. That's already a lot. Uh, that would be the longer shot where we will speak. Then it's your turn to work and to do the first exercise, which is getting started with Apache Cassandra. So if you look at the uh, URL we provide you, uh, you do have uh, this welcome page. 
And for the very first exercise, we will use a tool called DataStax Studio, which is notebook based, uh, but dedicated for Cassandra. So folks already using other notebooks then could have their hands on DataStax Studio and see how it looks like. Um, and then we will move to uh, Jupyter for the, the machine learning part. So DataStack Studio, you open it and you will see multiple uh, notebooks available. And I ask you to click on getting started with Cassandra. And here you will get something like that. And it's, you know, it's a standalone notebook. You can go there and start reading and start executing. And we do have 10 minutes to do it. So I will uh, start again, let's say at uh, in 10 minutes and move forward. Yep, uh, by this time, everyone should have got the email with the link. If by any occasion you didn't, write to Jack Fryer to get your uh, link to your uh, instance or yeah, that's exactly how link should look like. Some uh, characters, some numbers, ML intro, datastackstraining.com. And well, do the job. So it seems like some folks did not get the link. Um, so as I told you, everything is available on GitHub. So uh, you can go to uh, datastacks-academy account, and it's called Machine Learning Workshop Online. There, you will find everything as a Docker Compose file with you know, Cassandra, Jupyter, and the studio. So especially Jupyter and the studio, which is the two web uh, tools we will use. And see that we also provide the notebooks are as a volume. So go there and, you know, Docker Compose uh, up dash U, three lines, and you're good to go. Um, if you do not have installed Docker, it's also pretty quick to install. Uh, so three line and you're good to go. Still, uh, you would need, uh, let's say two to four CPU on your laptop to make that things work. Remember you start not only Cassandra, but also Spark, also Jupyter and DataStack Studio. That's quite a lot. So four to eight giga, gigabyte of RAM is not too much, uh, but yeah, you will get the link eventually. Actually, um... I see what all links were uh, dev delivered for a while already. So if you don't have link yet, please check your um, spam folder. Oh, there is a really great question in the YouTube chat. Where can I read more about Cassandra architecture? Oh. So yeah, uh, Cedric, you know what to open? Ladies and nope. gentlemen, uh, we prepare it an incredible place for you to be, which is the academy.datastacks.com. It's a set of courses absolutely for free 
with all the exercises, with all the paths and very different content. So this workshop today is only three hours and mostly about the machine learning. We are starting very soon. But if you want to be really cool with Cassandra, which deserves it, and uh, that's the place to be for everyone is the academy.datastacks.com. It's free, open, and available to everyone. And that's just great. Yep. So it's, yeah, you do have multiple theme. It's a total MOOC, total free. And you know what? Remember, we gave free venture today to, for you to pass the certification. And so to be able to pass the certification, you will have to train a little bit. And you, you do have all the training needed on the academy. And so to pass the developer certification, you should take DS101, 201, and 220. And if you want to have the admin, you can also pass uh, 210. Um, so both are free. You can take both. You don't have to get the voucher immediately. You simply ask to fill the form we gave you on Discord, and we'll give you uh, the link again and again for you to, you know, put your name, the email address you would lose, you would use in Academy, and yeah, work on those MOOC. When you feel ready, send us an email, me and Jack, um, and we will get you a voucher. This voucher is uh, available for 30 days, passing yep. the creation date. So you don't have to take it right now. Take your time. Uh, and if you are any issue about the courses you encounter, we are also available on community.datasax.com. It's Stack Overflow for Cassandra, okay? Uh, it's totally free. Again, we can answer any question. It can be on enterprise version, open source version. Here you go. Yep. Uh, there is a message in YouTube chat um, from... Uh, Abdesh Kumar, um, I was reading somewhere what Cassandra is based on master-slave architecture. So oh, what yeah. I can say, please find this source of information and burn it, burn it down with fire because it's just a complete lie. Uh, Cassandra is completely masterless from the very yes. beginning, so there is no chance it's master-slave. Yeah. 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 The full gossiping uh, protocol we saw in the slide too is peer-to-peer. So it's really peer-to-peer. -peer. And nodes just exchange the discrepancies, uh, if some, with this gossiping and only uh, copy delta if they are. Really, no. really peer-to-peer, -peer, no master. So uh, there is one more question. Yeah, uh, Kranti for. Kumar, uh, what will happen if my three nodes down out of 10 nodes which had my table data, which is having replication factor of three, isn't a type of data loss or not availability. So take a look. People often misunderstand data uh, amount of uh, servers in the cluster or in a single data center with a replication factor. If you have uh, 10 servers uh, within the same data center in replication factor three uh, for your data, it means what three replicas, three servers will store uh, copies, replicas of the data we are talking about. So what may happen? You have 10 servers, three are responsible for a record A, and you lost three servers out of this 10. Mostly probably, well, with some chances, those three will be not affected because actually you have 10. So uh, probability to get seven, uh, one of these seven down is higher. Oh, you switched to Naive Bayesian already? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm answering question, yes. And uh, if uh, you, uh, when, uh, when uh, let's talk about the situation when you lose one of the nodes, and uh, which is a one of the replica nodes, one of the nodes responsible for the record we are talking about. What goes when? Uh, it depends on your consistency level. If you go with consistency level quorum, you can afford losing one of the nodes, and uh, with two, you still will have your data fully available to read and to write. And if by uh, you are so unlucky to get down exactly the free servers, uh, all of them are free, not uh, all of them are free replica servers responsible for this record, 
obviously it's like if you go and shut down your your computer you cannot use it anymore so uh to make data more available what you want to have uh you want to take uh, you want to have all replication factor higher or to have multi data center deployment because you can be fully available despite any disasters only when you are multi data center within the single data center where is always a chance to make your data unavailable just because your data center is down and that happens that happens with aws google compute platform and so on that's the answer yeah but now if you do have only a single data center and you do have the replication factor three and you lose three nodes which all the replica you need then the driver will retry multiple times and it will feel, it will eventually reach a timeout and give you the error yes but you know even at the driver level we also retry the query multiple times and do the failover to other data center if there is any okay so during the end of the exercise i just show you a, a, a slide if you are already a cassandra user we see that we do have some hardcore guys uh, so uh, you might have known that now Datastax, since December, provide support, enterprise support, but also services now for OSS Cassandra. If you're still on 3.x, yeah, go to Datastax Luna and you get enterprise support for Cassandra. You know, price is about, let's say, yeah, 50, 50 bucks per node per month, something like that, okay? And you can quit anytime you want. During the pandemic, we also we have also announced that we could provide support, enterprise support for SS Cassandra for free. And this is called Ka Keep Calm on Cassandra On. There is a form, um, just filled, keep the uh, find a slot in, the, in their Calendly. And yeah, you will get our solution architect ready to help you fine tune your cluster if you need to for free. And it's only during pandemic. Uh, and uh, so we have we have also uh, Datastax Astra, which is Cassandra as a service, uh, which provide a free tier. You can use a GitHub account, Google account, go there, register, and you, are, you do have a three-node cluster for you, for free, forever. It's a free tier. Okay, It's not me selling. You know, I'm a community guy. Everything I told you is Cassandra open source, and you know it's free. And of course, that access community, but I share my screen already. You know that it's Stack Overflow for Cassandra. And you know what? We answer in now English, Chinese, Portuguese, French. Yep. Okay, let's move on. Okay, that's Luna. And uh, I keep the slide here for you to, you know, to download the slides and be able to follow the exercise later or so to pick any links you would have missed during this workshop. This is Astra. This is the keep calm form to fill to be able to, to get this free support. Uh, and yeah, Astra and a uh, community, you show it. Okay, so now what about Apache Spark? Well, Cassandra is all about the storage and is distributed. Uh, Spark is about computation. You want to do computation, distribute computation. And so that fit very well with Cassandra. Cassandra and Spark fit very well in, uh, in architecture for years and years and years. In uh, big data architecture, you, sometimes, you often find those two all along, and especially to do all that queries. Yep. I would call them best friends. Because, well, Cassandra is very well designed to store and dispatch data in milliseconds and uh, dispatch any amounts of the data. But when it comes to uh, complicated queries, analytics, and other things, uh, that's not the strongest side. And then there comes Apache Spark, which is the best guide to handle things like uh, analytics queries. And, well, we will see soon much more uh, complicated tools to do. Yeah, so speaking of that, you know, Spark is about data analytics or lab queries, but you will go deep into that with machine learning, so I won't go too much into that. Uh, but, you know, Spark is not always for real time. You can do, you know, seconds response time query with that. Okay, so Apache Spark is a framework for distributed computing. 
uh, most widely used, uh, available in R, Python, and Java, with multiple modules. So Spark is the core, and you do have Spark R, the, the R implementation. You do have GraphX for uh, graph kind of uh, data modeling, machine learning lib, Spark ML. This is the one you will use today uh, during our uh, workshop, hands on. Spark streaming for real time work, especially working with Kafka, streaming from Kafka into um, Cassandra, for instance. So maybe you have heard about Kafka stream, KSQL, and stuff. That's totally something that's doing the same stuff. So, but Spark streaming is a, a the full language. You can do loop, you can do test, you can do you know any algorithms you would like, and it's a bit more advanced than just moving the data. Okay, so the Cassandra instance you will work today does have a Spark integrated because it's the DataStax enterprise solution. It's, we are working with the Docker image. You can use it for free as long as you're not onto production. And so we do have Spark in the same binary as Cassandra. Okay, and in the DataStax enterprise product node, not only we have Spark, but we are also uh, extra stuff, uh, open source stuff like Lucene and Solar to do full text search and a graph database based on the work from Titan DB. Okay. So in the Data Stacks Enterprise node, you do have that in a single binary. But that will, what will interest us today is. Spark and Cassandra. If you do the proper data modeling with Cassandra, you will probably use OLTP, request reply, low latency queries. And if you want to do analytics on Cassandra data, full scan, you know, scanning the cluster, Spark is very good because it will distribute, you know, divide and conquer, map and reduce, distribute the computation among the node. And because we do have uh, two products in the same binary, now Spark is also kind of token aware. That means Spark will be able to spawn the executor close to the partition holding the data you need to work on. Okay, I need to do, uh, I don't know, count. <laughs> That's very basic. Okay, you spawn the executor on each node doing local count, boom, reduce and get the global count. And you know that works very well with distributed computation, and this is why those two work very well lo all along. You will do that later, okay? So I won't go too much there, but yeah. And so to come to that, <clears throat> so this is what you will do, guys. Uh, but here is the here is the Spark. Uh, it's a it's a Spark Scala code, and you will work with Python for disclosure. Uh, exercise will be Python, uh, but work the same, you know, create the Spark context, read tables or LDD or data frame, work with them, and go back to Cassandra by doing save to Cassandra. Okay, and as I told you, because Spark is token aware, you can spawn uh, executor on uh, the proper nodes. But you can also have a totally dedicated Spark cluster with a full you know, CPU power because you already have your own Spark cluster to do tons of things. And yeah, of course, you can do that with Cassandra open source. Not only DataStax have created the open source Spark driver, uh, but also uh, even in the DataStax enterprise stuff, we have something called bring your own Spark. Okay, come on, load the full, the fat jar with everything you need in your existing Spark cluster. And boom, you can start working uh, with Cassandra or the enterprise version data sets. All right, and how to enable Spark using DSC? Yeah, that's very complicated. Just do DSC Cassandra dash K. Also work for the search and graph, by the way. Dash key for analytics, dash G for graph, and dash, dash S for search. And that's it. So with that, you do have Cassandra to store data as table, very large amount of data, and you do have Spark, 
computation framework able to do distributed computation among multiple nodes with an embedded machine learning library. And we will work for those two guys to do some nice stuff. And we will switch to machine learning. So before we go with uh, Apache Cassandra related machine learning, we have to discuss what's the machine learning by itself. And uh, if you, like I did some years ago, went to Wikipedia to read about uh, machine learning by itself, you find out the old rule, wiki is useless. Then you already know how, what is it and how it works. You just don't need wiki. And if you don't know what is it and how it works, it will not help you with all those scientific, uh, scientific phrases. So like that's uh, walls of texts without any clear chance to understand it. I suggest us to use a much shorter definition. Machine learning is a science of drawing circles and colorizing them. And you know what? It still explains nothing, but it is at least much shorter, so already much better. Uh, instead of answering uh, definition questions, I want to speak about how it works so you will define it for, for yourself. Machine learning is a way to process raw data using algorithms to make better decisions. And that's very simple. And basically, all the process we will do later today is we will get some data, work with it using algorithms, and go with the decisions to show how it works. When uh, one more word about the use cases. So there are really a lot of use cases uh, for the machine learning. It's, it exists for some time and all the modern companies already using it more or less. And like, uh, I don't know, Uber, Netflix, all the other guys uh, of this size definitely using that. A lot of institutions, uh, scientific companies and so on. Mm -hmm. The most typical use cases from the applied point of view is uh, forecasting, forecasting for price, for ratings, for weather, for all the things like that. If you want to try to compute what's the estimated price or rating to be, for example, for something upcoming. Very often, very often use cases in operation, aberration detection uh, for people to be able to catch a fraud, uh, incoming fraud on the banking system, let's say, or an intrusion detection on the security system, or find a disease like that's a very uh, up to time, uh, very on time example, because, well, disease uh, findings are very important here. And then classification. Classification is also a very big topic. Uh, so for face recognitions, for any kind of categorizations, including, for example, spam detection. Basically, one of the first uh, usages for uh, uh, for machine learning was uh, spam detection. And well, spam detection is a very typical case for the categorization, answering a very simple question if this email is spam or not. Also, recommendations, navigations, and many, many, many others. I hope in some years later, you will suggest something very new, your new, your very own use case. So as we're speaking about raw data, I guess everyone understands what the raw data is, like the logs of uh, people traveling with Uber or logs of people buying something uh, on uh, Amazon and so on and so forth. With algorithms, it's more interesting uh, and maybe a bit not obvious. So we will talk a lot about algorithms in the future. There are really a lot of different algorithms. Uh, on the webinar some months ago, some people asked me like, uh, how to choose the best algorithm for my use case? And well, you know, it's really not easy uh, to answer these questions. There are multiple approaches and basically that's why uh, all those companies, that's why we need the data scientists. Those are the people who uh, find the best way to fit an algorithm into the situation to process data and make better decisions. And that's, there is no simple answer, I would say. OK. Um, there are multiple kinds of uh, machine learning. Today, we will speak about two most used and most, uh, how to say, basic and good to start 
Those are supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Uh, rule of thumb, how to uh, choose uh, is that a supervised on or some unsupervised. When you work with supervised machine learning, it's uh, all the uh, incoming data is already labeled. I will explain what it means in a moment. And for unsupervised data is not labeled. Imagine we working uh, with spam detector based on the machine learning, of course, to build up and train our algorithm to prepare everything we need to say yes, probably or no, or to uh, set some chance like, okay, this email is 80% spam. We have to, we need to have an existing database of normal emails and spam emails to build then predictions using this data. What does that mean? Some people getting emails push to a button. This is spam, this is spam, this is not spam. Despite they still asking for money, but it's my <laughs> uncle that's completely fine. Uh, so it's not a spam. <laughs> For what it looks like. Unless you put that in the category, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when a lot of people mark the same email as a spam, we have database what this email has been dispatched to 100,000 times and mark it as a spam uh, out of like 100 times. Not all the people press the button, some people just delete and so on. In this case, we work with labeled uh, entity. This email has been marked as spam before. And then using this email, we try to predict like next upcoming email, which is not labeled if it's spam or not. So all the data we process it with algorithm has been labeled by someone, for example, by people like when we are speaking about emails. Um, in, but that's not obviously not only about the emails also. Operation is a fraud. We know when, uh, uh, like, we are working at bank and some person, some client is calling to the um, uh, operator and says, like, okay, there are some money disappeared from my account. I didn't do this operation. And, okay, it was a fraud. Let's take a look at that. And then we have a huge collection of different frauds so we can work with this database. Again, data is labeled. And we can say, okay, this operation is a fraud, this email is a spam, this subscription was canceled. Like if you want to try to predict subscriptions, those are going to be canceled soon. That's also a very good use case to try to stop people uh, from unsubscription with some, I don't know, special actions or offers. Typical case is a classification or a regression. We already have data with some labels on it. Good side of supervised learning is it's easy to test. So we train our algorithm. I will show you how it works later. And when uh, using some kind of uh, uh, test data, training data, so we uh, test data which we hide from algorithm, don't give it to algorithm, and then we run algorithm of a test data and see, okay, it works good or it works not really good. Second kind, kind is an unsupervised machine learning. So. Obviously, that's a situation when data is not labeled and cannot be easily labeled. And it helps us to find some patterns in the data. Like a typical use case is an anomaly detection. We expect like something is wrong, but we can't really say, is it wrong or is it okay? What's the aberration? What's the situation? Uh, very often use it for clustering, like you have uh, application and multiple people using this application. And you want to have understanding like there are, uh, we have like a lot of users, 1 million of users, 100 millions of users, but they are different. They have different needs. Like, you know, uh, I'm using uh, YouTube and my daughter uses YouTube. Our behavior, our uh, options are very different. We need uh, to use uh, these unsupervised uh, things uh, for to cluster people, to group people into different groups, for example. And also very many uh, different approaches. That's not like supervised it is better than unsupervised or vice versa. No, they're just for different purpose. So let's now watch how exactly it works. Learning workflow. We discussed already what machine learning is a, a way to process data with some algorithms to get better decisions. And uh, that's the workflow, uh, learning workflow of how it usually goes. And we will discuss it now very step by step. So don't try to read it all at once. We will now 
get through the steps. Good. So it's a scientific approach. So first, we have to ask a question. And choosing a question, choosing a good question, uh, choosing a, creating a hypothesis, it's a half of the work, let's say. Um, based on the situation we have, data we have, and question we are trying to answer, we are choosing an algorithm. Then we are preparing our data because raw data, raw data may be uh, too much or not clean or any way to be prepared, to be processed. And we split data into different sets. So there are multiple approaches. Like uh, for this one, we will split data to three, step, to three pieces. Um, then base it on the testing set and validate. Then base it on the validating set, we will um, estimate our model, how it goes, like if our model, if our algorithm is good. And uh, when based it on the testing, then everything is good. We will put new data, which we didn't have, uh, like new incoming email, which we didn't have when we trained the algorithm, apply it and try to predict labels. Is, it, is, this, is this email is spam or not? Is this person is sick or not? And so on. So, uh, speaking deeper, first it goes with raw data and preparation for data with features and labels uh, to be it understandable for the algorithm. Then they split data. Training set, usually like around 60, 70, 80 persons, well, it depends on your situation, sometimes higher. You prepare this set of the data we will use to train algorithm. Validating set. Uh, which is hidden from the model in the beginning. We will use to tune model, like adjust some settings. And testing set, we will use to estimate model in the end how it does, like to use some metrics and to see if it's a good model or we did not really good. And um, OK, so train and validate, tune, estimate, and then uh, deliver a final model, which works very quickly because training has been done already, and predict labels based on this thing. So that's a typical case for the uh, supervised um, machine learning. And uh, now, where is the place for Cassandra in these workflows? First, Cassandra stores heterogeneous data. Like, imagine you are trying to build um, spam detection uh, algorithm model based on the three different emails. How, how would be the accuracy of this model? It's obviously going to be very well, not really well. So to work with machine learning, you need to have a lot of data. Best place to store a lot of data, well, one of the best places to store a lot of data is Cassandra. So it's an um, operational database which dispatches and stores everything very quickly. And uh, we can gather data from various sources and uh, store it all together with Cassandra, like a part of a streaming process. Well, there can be different processes. As yeah. a next, yep. Just, just saying that you can you know, specify your training set, validating set based on different partitions first. Yep. To get your you know, sub range. Uh, but maybe it could introduce some you know, BA in, in the queries. So, you also try to, 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 to train your model on multiple partitions, of course, and it's already tables, and it's already formatted for, uh, you know, to be used as input for most of algorithms already. Yep. Uh, best thing for us here is uh, usually there is nearly no need to clean data because Cassandra already has a tabular model and integrates with Spark really, really easily. So basically, no more, uh, not so much job for us to prepare the data. With our systems, it may be very different. Um, yep. Yes, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, that data modeling is all about denormalization. So you do have scarce table, very wide uh, multiple row, multi multiple columns, so a lot of you know columns to to store the data, and it fits also well to you know define which criteria could you know have an impact on the uh, vector you're trying to predict. Uh, yep. Uh, well, uh, as the next step, we uh, model building, selecting the machine learning algorithm. So we choose and prepare uh, model, we choose and prepare algorithm to work with this data. 
And uh, working with this model, we also can store results in the Cassandra in separate tables because in some cases, output can be quite significant. So we still want to store it very quickly without any delays. And finally, we can use the fruits of our work to see uh, how was it, what we can predict, and how we can improve our decisions based on the steps we did before. Now, you cannot control what you can't measure. That's a golden rule. And a good thing, there are a lot of available metrics for machine learning models. So you can um, assess them and decide if this model is good or not. Let's start. It's not obvious. You will see it very soon. Um, I will show accuracy uh, based on uh, very well known in um, data science field, a tumor example. It's a very good example to show what's the accuracy. Accuracy is a metric uh, evaluating classification models. How many of predictions uh, were done correctly? So accuracy is an amount of correct prediction uh, divided by total predictions we done. Now take a look at the right at the tumor example. We have 100 people, nine of them have malignant tumor, which is very, very bad, and 91 of them have uh, benign, uh, benign tumor, which is well bad, but not so disastrous. So we have 100 people, all of them are sick, some of them like very badly sick, and some of them are not so badly sick. And that's very important to identify them uh, very on time, because if we are late, some people may die, and that's what we want to avoid. And we have designed a model which identified one person as a true positive. So we were right, he, he, was, uh, uh, he or she was really sick. Uh, one number of false positive. So we identified it is a uh, badly sick, but we were wrong. Uh, we identified 90 person as a true negative. So we identified a tumor as a banning in 90 cases. Which is case, which is a very good result out of 91 uh, having it, and we did false negative out of eight. Uh, so we said what a person has not so bad tumor, despite it has uh, he she has a uh, very bad tumor. So when we calculating the accuracy, answer is going to be correct predictions divided by total predictions 91 divided by 100 0.91. So our accuracy is very close to one, and one is the absolute maximum we can have. Based on the accuracy, we can say what our model is good. Do you think if it's good? Answer is no. Because take a look. We send back home eight people having very, very, very bad tumor without proper treatment. And now take a look. That's a magic. We could have better result by literally throwing a coin. You throw a coin, you see, okay, sick, not sick, sick, not sick, sick, not sick. 50 persons, uh, we would identify more uh, seriously sick people just throwing a coin instead of all the algorithms we use it. So accuracy is a very special metric. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. So uh, stay and watch what you are doing. There are more metrics to help. Uh, two more metrics we want to discuss is a precision versus an recall. And those are very different. Precision, also known as positive predictive value. It counts only true positives out of all true and false positive. So uh, for tumor example, precision is 0 0.5 because we identified one true positive out of two positives. Like, take a look before. We identified one true positive, one false positive. So it makes two. And as a result, one divided by two will be 0 0.5. Sensitivity, also known as a recall, recall or sensitivity, it's the same. Counts correctly identified positives out of all real positives. So recall or sensitivity is an amount of true positives divided by all real positives. And for the example we gave, uh, recall is 1 divided by 9, so 0 0.11, and that clearly signs what we have, uh, well, not so good model. 
Um, what's important for us to understand? There is one serious limitation. Uh, these metrics are contradict each other. 